Uh, well, hello, people. Um, it's Jim Austin here from the New South Wales branch. Uh, and today we're going to um, have a talk by uh, Dr. Stuart Clark and Patrick Makaluni from uh, University of New South Wales on tilting of the Australian continent, new evidence from subsidence and deposition history of the Northern Carnarvon Basin. Um, I just want to thank um, all of our um, corporate members uh, just to come up there. Uh, and thank you to our branch sponsors, um, particularly to GBG uh, for the New South Wales branch. So uh, member benefits, just want to highlight a couple this week. Um, it's come up in the, the wrong spot, unfortunately. Um, but uh, one of the great things um, that we do have to offer as a, a member benefit, particularly in New South Wales, is access to uh, social um, social uh, things, uh, such as the ASEG New South Wales branch dinner. Um, and we've got one coming up. Um, it's on the 21st of July at the Australian Hotel in the Rocks. Um, that's come up all wrong. Uh, this event's for New South Wales members, um, and it's $100 per couple, $60 for singles, and $30 for students. Um, so contact Steph if you want to get involved. Also, um, the AEGC is coming up. Um, the, um, the talks have been announced in the last couple of weeks, and we've got um, quite a number of talks um, from New South Wales branch members, uh, some of which are shown here. Um, if you want to keep in touch, um, you can do so via uh, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, etc. And just uh, for any of those, any people online, um, if you'd like to ask a question um, during this talk, uh, just hit the Q&A uh, button here. Okay, so, um, so Stuart Clark um, is our first Gen X speaker of the year. Hooray for Gen X. Um, having spent time at University of Sydney in the golden days of grunge and indie music in the late 90s. Um, he's a geophysicist with an interest in basin formation processes um, along active and passive margins. And his specialities include geodynamics, uh, basin dynamics, plate tectonics and reconstructions, subduction zones, numerical modeling, visualization of geophysical data, uncertainty analysis, and this is uh, in the oil industry mainly. So he spent 10 years working in the oil industry um, with clients delivering uh, R&D projects before starting as a lecturer at uh, UNSW about four years ago, where he's uh, currently supervising several PhD projects, including Patrick's. Uh, so Patrick is not surprisingly a PhD student at UNSW, um, and he's going to be the recipient of a ASCG um, funding to go to AEGC later this year. He's working on um, understanding kinematic processes around the formation of sedimentary basins. Uh, so please welcome uh, Stuart and Patrick. Is at some point, I guess. Okay, this is rather awkward. <laughs> so I can hear. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, so today uh, Patrick and I uh, sort of got roped in. Uh, I guess we'll twist this a little bit this way. Uh, last minute to uh, to um, you know talk about um, talk about our work on basin analysis in the Northwest Shelf. Uh, so I just thought you know to give a bit of context around where we're going. Um, I talk a little bit about a project that we're just starting uh, called Kinematica. Uh, so I'll sort of first introduce that and then hand over to uh, Patrick to talk around uh, what he's done in the Northwest Shelf. So Patrick's been a role for about um, two and a half, two, nearly three years. And, uh, and uh, sort of just coming towards the end of uh, pumping out a bunch of, bunch of papers and a lot of, a lot of good work around the Northwest Shelf. So um, all right, so yeah, re recently we just uh, got funded a project called Kinematica. Um, 
uh, Barvik, who's uh, in the audience, is uh, uh, on that project as a um, as a postdoc, and um, it's a collaboration between um, us at UNSW uh, and uh, the University of Sydney with uh, Tristan Sals and uh, CSIRO in the form of Eurocausa. And then we've got some uh, uh, we've got some commercial partners, including Santos and Lundin Norway, an oil company in Norway. Um, and uh, Geoscience Australia as well. And uh, we also work with uh, LMU Munich on the geodynamics part for, with Professor Bunga. Um, yeah, the aim is to kind of improve exploration methods and in this way, like make better use of data that's existing. So reducing the footprint of, um, I guess, ge geophysical acquisition, um, making uh, maybe making better choices with the targets of, of acquisition and, uh, and therefore sort of, you know, yeah, I guess making better use of them. So you're not collecting as much, not needing to collect as much and making, you know, making better choice about where you do collect them. Uh, yeah, we've got a bit of, a bit of uh, news on that front. So uh, these were announced uh, on the Energy News Bulletin and also in the Guardian. Um, so it's kind of good. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, one, of the, one of the reasons that we explored this was the idea of kind of uh, looking at base and dynamics um, outside the kind of active um, base and formation processes that are occurring. So after the basin is um, beginning to, you know, we've got this thermal subsidence period and the basin is kind of, you know, supposed to be more or less passive margin, but we find that there's a lot of different things going on in terms of tilting and things like that. So you can see on the, on the rightmost image here, uh, from Indrava at all 2018. Um, we have different um, sections of the uh, sedimentary strata which have uh, thickening, um, thickening westward, thickening uh, eastward um, sections. And that kind of indicates the whole, you know, the whole platform as being kind of tilting up, upwards and downwards um, throughout the Cretaceous. Um, and so, you know, this is, this can affect oil and gas migration and, you know, and uh, the development of, of these resources. So it's quite, quite interesting to look at how that can evolve dynamically. And then from a geodynamics perspective, what is causing that kind of, that kind of motion. And, and uh, obviously the, the tectonics is, is not, um, not sort of such an easy uh, cell in terms of how, how it can be creating that motion. Um, it's a it's a sort of fairly complicated process. So you know, could it be crustal crustal processes? Can it be dynamic topography? Um, can there be um, you know long, uh, far field effects from from uh, uh, compression or or uh, plate tectonics that are kind of bound, sort of bounding effects, if you like, from the plate boundaries? So there's a bunch of different mechanisms that could could make it. So we've been looking into this kind of this kind of components. So the idea with Kinematica is to kind of create something that's fairly simple from a um, model selection perspective. So a lot of the uncertainty analysis out there is kind of looking at, you know, whether we tilt a fault this way or that way by a few degrees and what, what will that impact on the uncertainty. Um, we're kind of looking more from a, you know, is there is there a fault or not? Is is there an economic target or not? Um, those kind of those kind of uh, sides, and it can also be applied to obviously the mineral exploration world as well. And we want to track inference across the entire workflow. So we want to look at um, base and dynamics in the context of plate plate tectonics. We want to look at um, all these different processes like erosion and and so forth, rotation, decompaction, and subsidence. So we've been building some of the mechanisms for that and, and Patrick's work is built on top of um, other students that have worked with me on, on that. Um, and then, yeah, looking at how we can sort of encapsulate that in a, in a uh, inference uh, mechanism, so a Bayesian framework or something like that. And then of course, doing sort of rigorous testing of our model. So looking at, you know, can we identify the difference between different targets and uh, and you know uh, different angles of those targets uh, based on prior probabilities and posterior uh, calculations of the posterior. So I guess this is kind of the the, the overall goal of the project. Um, you know, just to give you an idea of how that might look, we build us some. Let's say we have a bunch of geophysical data or geological data sets, and we kind of look at well, there's there's some uncertainty, and we could go this way or this way in terms of interpreting the geology. And then you can go, you know, from that you can spin out and go, well, we, we have some uncertainty in kind of characterizing the reservoir. So, you know, is this block more densely packed or, or less so and, and so forth. And then 
basically build that out into a petroleum systems modeling framework um, and looking at how the reservoir might form. So if we could connect all of these layers, instead of doing them separately, we can actually build a kind of system that we can track uncertainties um, and choices uh, between, between all these and calculate what the probability or likelihoods of each of these outcomes could be. Um, so that, that's kind of the component, but in order to do that, we have to simplify the physics a little bit and um, not do you know, full reservoir modeling, like migration modeling of oil and gas, because that's, uh, you know, there's so many parameters going into that. And then it's very hard to build a dynamic basin when you're calculating that very to, a, you know, to the nth degree. So we want to make it a little bit simpler and a bit more dynamic. So we can actually involve maybe geologists in the, in the process that are, um, can, you know, look at the geological modeling and sort of see how the dynamic evolution occurs um, and then look at different, what the impact of different choices can be. Yeah, so just sort of building, I guess, interpretation, building in processes, looking at different scenarios, and then hopefully impacting decision making in terms of, you know, what are the probabilities of particular volumes being there or whatever reservoir properties you're interested in. So we could also be interested in, for example, you know, we, this could be applied to um, minerals exploration, could also be applied to geothermal um, fields and so forth. There's nothing particularly oil and gas about this except for the migration component. But migration is also important in terms of now we see that um, where minerals are deposited also is sort of ancient migration of fluids a lot of the time. So those um, that that kind of fluid systems can be important in those in those systems as well. And obviously in geothermal uh, systems too. So we applied this to a bunch of re regions. So we looked at um, uh, doing uh, interpretation, uh, seismic interpretation of the, the low behind, sort of trying to automate that to build in automated uh, sort of, you know, auto big uh, geological models based on the seismic data, sort of automating that process as much as possible. And so we can sort of populate these geological models with, with geophysical data and generate potential, you know, potentially different models um, already from the geophysical data um, very quickly, and then maybe tweaking those um, to to look at, you know, uh, I don't know, I guess in this case we can look at that there are some faults that are can be interpreted by the model given certain parameters, and others, and the same fault may may not be interpreted. So we can sort of look at that as two different potential models in the space, and uh, and then uh, calculate uncertainties based on that. And uh, yeah, we also looked at, I guess, this is probably one of the, you know, starting points looking at the West Siberia basin and the dynamics of the basin. Um, you know, it's a very quiet basin tectonically um, in recent times. Um, you know, it was, it's, it's the, essentially the assembly point between uh, uh, Western or Europe and, and, uh, yeah, and Asia. Um, and this, yeah, this basin was kind of formed in that, in that, um, uh, at, at that point around 500 million years ago or 400, 450 million years ago. And then after that, um, it, it's sort of pretty quiet except for the Siberian traps, which uh, kick off at the, um, at the end of the, uh, the at the Permian, Permian Triassic at the end of the Permian. Um, but apart from that, there's really uh, not a lot of tectonics going on. And so we thought we'd look at this area and sort of have a look at how um, the uh, the basin developed with respect to say the sea level curves that you see here. So we can see that um, while you get a sea level high at about 80 million years ago, um, you're actually not not that not that uh, high, uh, not that high in terms of paleo water depth. And and as as the sea level is rising uh, around the around the 100 million year mark, you actually have a kind of uh, uplift of the basin, and there's the the water depth is a sort of minimum. So um, that, that's kind of interesting. So, what what could be driving that tectonics and looking at um, plate, uh, looking at the the mantle as a potential component for driving um, that uplift uh, is one thing we did in that paper. So, I guess you know, building on that, we wanted to look a little bit at the Northwest Shelf, and uh, so you know, we kind of move over to that area now, and uh, uh, Patrick can kind of uh, begin talking about that. All right, thanks, Stuart. Uh, I think the introductions have already been made, uh, but I'll still mention my name. I'm Patrick. 
and uh, I'm a PhD student. Um, I've been working with Stuart since 2018, and uh, yeah, he's been an awesome supervisor. Yeah, can you hear now? All right. Yeah, so uh, since 2018, uh, my project has been uh, fairly about uh, geodynamics and um, mostly in the Northwest Shelf. And uh, this part of work that I'm presenting today is part of my PhD. It's one of the first projects that I did. And uh, uh, this work, uh, I'll, in my talk, I'll probably talk about uh, the, the, the region in general, just introduce the region and why we did the work there. And uh, uh, our work has been focused on the Northwest Shelf, as Stuart has already said, and uh, mostly this project is in the Northern Carnarvon Basin. Of course, I've done other projects in the Bonaparte Basin, but uh, basically what I do is the uh, geodynamics, basically looking at the motions within the sedimentary basins, uh, lateral motions, vertical motions, so that's like subsidence, uplift, and uh, one of the more interesting uh, projects that I'm doing currently is looking at the lateral motions doing the reconstructions. But today I'll talk about the substance projects. So uh, the project is tilting of the Australian continent. So we kind of looking at the evidence that the tilting of the continent has in the sedimentary basins, mostly in the Northwest Shelf. So uh, there's been a lot of evidence that have been presented uh, mostly the, uh, the, the marine inundation, inundation and the, uh, uh, other studies, the geological study of the region has shown that uh, the Australian continent has been tilting. But when, when we look at the basin itself and then look at how its evolution can be impacted by such an, uh, such an event, uh, we decided to develop models. So, First off, I'll just talk about the actual uh, geological uh, history of the region and the major tectonic events that have impacted the area. So Northern Carnarvon Basin, which is situated around here uh, in the southern part of the uh, Northwest Shelf, has been mostly affected by the major tectonic events which started in the Permian, uh, mostly the, uh, the extension which uh, led to the formation of the Northwest Shelf. And during that time, the Northern Carnarvon Basin was kind of an intracontinental basin. But later in the Triassic, where there's, there was a, a lot of rifting that happened around that time, uh, the basin developed uh, a lot of sub-basins within this area. And uh, so these large scale tectonic events May have an imprint in the evolution of the basin, but how do we how do we connect that to uh, stuff like uh, sedimentation and sub subsidence within the basin? So when we look at the northern Carnarvon basin itself, uh, most of the uh, larger tectonic events that affected the basin happened in the uh, Triassic period, where the, the, there's like uh, the late Triassic. Uh, rifting and then there was a, a late Jurassic rifting which created the Jurassic subbasins. But now looking at uh, the general, that general tectonic uh, history and then uh, further looking at uh, let's say in the late Cretaceous where you have the, uh, the Australian continent separating from Antarctica uh, and then combining all these larger tectonic events, we, I, we assessed the the sedimentary, the stratigraphic chart of the uh, northern Carnarvon Basin. And one of the interesting things in the stratigraphic chart is that uh, you see that the general uh, tectonic history suggests that the uh, northern Carnarvon Basin has been quiet around the late, from the late Cretaceous into the Cenozoic until the present. But looking at the stratigraphic chart, you see that there is a continuation of sedimentation and uh, there's a bit of variation within the sedimentation of the sub-basins of the Northern Carnarvon Basin. And uh, one could be asking, well, how did this happen? And looking at uh, a, a, an area that has been uh, quiet, let's say, for example, in the Cenozoic, but you see a bit of variation, let's say in the South uh, Exmouth sub-basin, you see a bunch of hiatuses of sedimentation. And then you're looking at the Big O sub-basin 
uh, further in the north, you see that there's a bit of uh, more sedimentation happening within the same periods of time. So to, to be able to connect the tectonic history of the basin and the actual sedimentation and be able to, uh, let's say, see how uh, these are correlating with each other. So that was the main project, uh, the main aim of this project to be able to connect the larger tectonic events that impacted the region and the sedimentation patterns and the subsidence of the region. And looking at the stratigraphy itself, it's suggesting that there has been something happening, but maybe we can't really put a finger on it and how, what uh, particular tectonic events can we associate with these uh, features that we see in the stratigraphic chart. So, uh, so to, to kind of have that connection, to develop that connection, we decided to, to, to look at the subsidence patterns and then the sedimentation patterns and, the, and how they impact the, the let's say, the, the porosity or the, the petroleum system of the basin. And uh, we, we looked at, uh, we used uh, decompaction and, uh, and backstripping and these, these processes. Uh, using these processes, we can actually uh, uh, model the sediments, uh, sediment thicknesses and the subsidence at, at any particular time. And uh, we did this for each and the particular, uh, for each of these wells that um, uh, are showing here. So uh, we had a bit, uh, over 244 wells, but the way we selected these wells was based on how deep they are and also how close they are. And uh, this, uh, the Northern Carnarvon Basin has a lot of uh, boreholes, but the distribution is kind of biased towards the sub-basins where you get uh, a lot of oil and gas. So we couldn't model the whole basin we, because there's a lack of uh, boreholes in the Northern part of the Exmouth Plateau. So we kind of concentrated on this area most of mostly. And uh, so and uh, another, another aspect on the data that we used was the depth because the, the, the northern Carnarvon Basin is kind of deep. So you have some sedimentary sections like the Triassic uh, sections that go up to five kilometers deep. So the boreholes can't go up to that depth. So our modeling was constrained by the, the depth and the way we selected these boreholes, some of them are a bit shallower. So we had to choose the ones that go as deep as possible to be able to model these, uh, the sedimentation and the subsidence of the area. So uh, when uh, doing the decompaction and backstripping, the kind of data that we needed uh, was this borehole uh, data and uh, Mostly we were looking at, so you get the, the, you go to the borehole, you look at the well completion report, and then you get the stratigraphic data. So to, we, 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 we actually wanted to model this in different time steps. So we divided the stratigraphic uh, chart into 13 time steps based on the lithology, the age, and the presence of unconformities within the, within the stratigraphic chart. And the kind of data that we needed for the decompaction and backstripping, uh, mostly the surface porosity, which is the kind of the porosity that you get before uh, the compaction of the sedimentary layer, and then the exponential decay constant. But this one you get from the uh, literature. But but this what it actually means is that uh, it's 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 a term that shows how the compaction or, or the porosity of a layer changes with depth because as you keep on, uh, uh, sed uh, when sediments keep coming, they compact the ones below. So we keep uh, burying the sediments, you, you reduce the porosity. And then we also looked at the grain density and then we take the surface, top surface depth of each and every layer and then use this kind of data to to be able to determine how much subsidence. So this subsidence is like how much accommodation space that was available during that period of time. So from Jurassic to the present. And uh, so I'll take you through the backstripping procedure 
which is fairly simple, maybe to some people that already know, but I'll still just give uh, a brief description. So normally to get uh, the actual accommodation space that is available for sediments, uh, we, we, we need to determine the actual sediment thickness at the time the sediments were being deposited. So when you are doing bag stripping, uh, you get a stratigraphic chart like this one. So this is just a, 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 like a, a sketch, but this sedimentary section, in our case, it has been divided into uh, 13 sections, but this is just like a sediment, uh, a sediment, a, a sediment uh, section. So what you do when you're back stripping is that, uh, for example, you have water and then you have sediments and then you have basement rocks. And then first off, you remove the water section and then model how the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the layers below it going to respond to that unloading. So that's what we do, uh, we call isostasy. And then after that, you remove the top layer of the sediments and then decompact the bottom layers uh, because when you unload the, 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 the top layer, the, the bottom layers, uh, it's like you're bringing the, the one that was below it to the surface. So you, you're restoring the porosity, the surface porosity of that layer, because now you have put it at the top. And then once you do that, you correct for uh, isostasy as well, because you have unloaded the, the, the lithosphere, and then you can make correction based on the uh, 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 paleo bathymetric data. Then once you do that, you can now uh, estimate how much sediments were deposited at that particular time because then that, that surface is on that, that layers on the surface. Then you repeat that procedure until all the layers have been removed and then you get to the section that you want. So what that what that process does is giving you uh, the deposition of thicknesses and the subsidence or the available uh, the available accommodation space at that particular time. So, and then after uh, assessing the sedimentation and the available accommodation space, we also needed to assess the sedimentation uh, rates and the substance rates because our, our uh, uh, time steps had different durations. Uh, so to remove the bias, to remove the bias of those different durations, we had to divide the sedimentation and the subsidence uh, by time so that we can be able to get the subsidence and re uh, substance rest and sedimentation rest. And these are particularly very important because with, once you get, for example, if you get higher subsidence rates, these periods can correlate to period of uh, rifting. That's when you get active rifting, you get a lot of subsidence, and then uh, you can correlate this to the larger tectonic events that are happening. And then uh, the higher sub uh, sedimentation rates as well, they are very important because, uh, for example, when you're looking at hydrocarbons, when you get a lot of sediments coming in, you, you kind of bury the hydrocarbons so that you don't, they don't get uh, uh, decomposed. Uh, as well, if you increase this sedimentation rates, you end up diluting your hydrocarbons as well. So it, af after some point, you you get to it. It affects the final uh, source rock. And uh, these subsidence rates and sedimentation rates can also affect the reservoirs below them because once you get a lot of sediments coming in, you are kind of compacting the layers below that. So we also assessed that. Uh, and how we did that is to get the amount of substance that we calculated before and use it to, 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 to model the porosity uh, using the decompaction equation that I've just showed you before. And uh, lastly, we also assessed the tilting uh, and the dynamic topography in the area. So the substance that we got in particular wells, we kind of plotted them along uh, against latitude. So I don't know if you can see my cursor, but we assessed it in three different directions. So the Northeast Southwest transect, and then we also uh, did it in the North South, which is this blue line. And then we did it in the East West, which is this uh, pink line. So why we did that is to just see how the tectonic subsidence is changing uh, across the basin 
and, and see if we can get a signal that correlates with the tilting of the Australian continent. So uh, then I will now present the results of the uh, sub uh, subsidence that we, we did. So what I'm going to show you now is the maps of uh, subsidence. This is, uh, so after we did the subsidence for all the wells that we assessed, we created maps using the GMT and just do the interpolation using the area that we have. So I'm just gonna show you how the area has evolved in terms of subsidence on, uh, or in other ways, how much accommodation space was created through time from early Jurassic to the present. So as you can see, this is from 200 million years to 108 million years. Uh, so the red uh, is higher subsidence and the blue is low subsidence. So we get a lot of subsidence in the uh, southwestern region, which is the Exmouth uh, Plateau area and parts of the Exmouth Subbasin, then a little bit in the Barrow Subbasin. And then we get some in the north, uh, northern part. So moving to 180 to 160 million year period, we see that there's a bit of change in subsidence where you don't get much in the Exmouth Plateau, but you're getting a lot in the Barrow Subbasin, and then you're getting some in the uh, Southern Exmouth Subbasin and a little bit in the Northern part. So as we proceed through time, we see that there's, there's a bit of shift now. Uh, this is around early Cretaceous, where you don't get much subsidence in the uh, Exmouth Subbasin. There's a bit of shift going uh, northeast and then southwest around the Exmouth Plateau. So uh, from 132 to 125, we see that there's a bit of shift as well. So we don't get much in the southern part, and then we're getting a little bit of more subsidence within the central region and we're proceeding. So this is uh, purely indicating that they, there's a bit of quietness uh, in the in the region. We don't get much subsidence around this time. And then we, we kind of picking up around 113 million years ago to 94 million years back. So I'll just uh, move through this and then I want you to notice how there's a shift going into the north eastern direction from the late Cretaceous going into the Cenozoic. So you see the subsidence is going all the way northeast until the present. So now you see that there isn't much in the southwestern part, and then all the subsidence is happening in the north east, uh, north northern part, which is the northeastern part of our study region. And now I'll also present uh, the, the sedimentation patterns that we found in the region, which of course looks a bit similar to the subsidence, but of course, apart from the Exmouth Plateau, because this area, we got a lot of subsidence during this same time, but we don't get a lot of sediments going in that area. But for Exmouth, uh, subbasin and the Barrow subbasin, we're still getting similar signal like we did in the subsidence map. So I'll just keep flipping through and then keep your eyes on how the, uh, the, the map is changing. So the red as well is high sediments and then the blue is low sedimentation. So we can see that in the early Cretaceous, there's also that shift from the south going into the central part of the uh, study region. Yeah. All right, so this is also similar to what we saw previously where there's a bit of quietness and we don't get a lot of sedimentation. But now the sedimentation is picking up, but it's picking up somewhere uh, northeastern uh, towards the Dampier Subbasin as we flick through to, to the Cenozoic, we see that most of the now the sedimentation is happening in this area only. So there's literally nothing happening in the Exmouth Subbasin. 
until the present where you have a lot of sedimentation happening in the uh, northeastern part. So uh, after assessing that sedimentation and uh, subsidence patterns, we kind of looked at uh, how this might affect the reservoirs. So we modeled the porosity evolution of the, uh, the, the early Cretaceous sediments, which is, uh, 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 but this was only focusing on the subbasins because uh, we couldn't model the porosity in the Exmouth Plateau because uh, there might be a bit of uplift happening there. So the porosity might not give us good indication of what's going on. So now uh, these maps are just showing how the porosity of the barrel, sub, uh, the barrel group sandstones and part of the, of course they change the name as we go into the bigger subbasin, but mostly it's the uh, early Cretaceous sediments porosity that we have modeled here. So the colors are a bit different now, the dark colors are low porosity and the lighter colors are high porosity. So as we see, we, we, we modeled this from the time these sediments were deposited, which is the early Cretaceous. And as we can see that there's already a low porosity in the Exmouth subbasin as we go towards the uh, Barrow subbasin as well. So mostly uh, when we move through to 113 million years, we can see that the porosity it keeps decreasing in the north eastern direction. As we go into the Cenozoic, much of the uh, area in the Exmouth and Barrow subbasins, the porosity was pretty much low. But as we go into the Cenozoic to the present, we see that there's quick decrease of porosity in the northeastern part as even compared to the southern part, which started earlier. So this signal is probably suggesting something that we need to discover and correlate with the, uh, the tectonic evolution of the area. So just plotting the porosity evolution, again, as time, we could, uh, we could pick up some points which actually show that there's uh, a lot of flatness in the Exmouth subbasin as compared to uh, the other subbasins. So the Exmouth and Barrow subbasins, which are in the southwestern part of the study region, we can see that these portions of the porosity uh, plots are kind of flat, which means, which may suggest an uplift or a regional uplift, probably not local uplift. But as we can see in the Dampier and Bigo subbasin, there's a continuous decrease of porosity, which, which suggests that there's a continuous uh, uh, sedimentation uh, from the Cretaceous to the present as compared to the Barrow and Exmouth subbasins. So just to check whether our porosity models are correlating with the actual measured porosity, we, we, we compared with the, uh, the, the porosity measurements from the well completion reports that we collected and there was really a good match of uh, our model porosity and the uh, measured porosity. So uh, the next step was to now uh, correlate our subsidence patterns to the uh, tilting of the Australian continent. So, and uh, as I showed you earlier, how we did that, we, we plotted the tectonic subsidence of few selected wells in the region uh, against latitude and longitude. So I will show you uh, plots of that. Uh, so from the early Jurassic, so what you are seeing is that there's a bit of, so this is south and north, and then this is southwest, this is northeast, this is west, this is east. So this is just basically uh, comparing the subsidence across the three transects just to show. So this tilt shows that you have more subsidence in the south and southwestern part of the region and the western region as compared to their east, northeast and north. So there's less subsidence happening around here and there's more subsidence happening in the southwestern part of the study region. 
So as we go to early Cretaceous, you see that there's a bit of flatness. This is, so if we, if we remember uh, our sedimentation and subsidence maps, this is when most of the sediments and the subsidence shifted towards the central part of the study region. And then there's a bit of flatness which showing that there's a bit of balance of subsidence across the region. But now as we move into the Cenozoic, you see that now the subsidence has changed direction and we are getting a lot more subsidence in the northern part and northeastern part. However, in the west east direction, the, direct, uh, the, the subsidence is still not changing. So we can only see that there's a change from uh, west east in the Jurassic, but once we get to Cretaceous, there's a bit of flatness, which is also repeated in the, uh, in the late Cretaceous as well. And going to the Cenozoic, you see that the tilting towards uh, the north and the northeast is continuing as compared to east western direction where the, there's still a bit of flatness. So the last row is the present. So from 11 million years to the present, we see that there's still uh, more subsidence in the northeastern part and the north as compared to east-west direction. So, and then there's also a bit of uh, dynamic topography that we did not want to miss. So we, we kind of took a model from Muller uh, and compared the dynamic topography uh, subsidence and uplift of the area and compared to the subsidence that we got from our backstripping. And uh, there's a bit of, we, we highlighted uh, this, these two uh, areas where in the dynamic topography model, there was uh, uplift. And as we can see in few backstripped wells, so this one, there's a bit of flatness. And this, these, these actually plots are from the Bigo subbasin, and this is Exmouth subbasin. So we did this deliberately because this Bigo subbasin is far northeast, and the Exmouth subbasin is in the southwest to see if they correlate with the dynamic topography model. But as we can see that in the southwest, there is a bit of more regional uplift from the dynamic topography until probably 20 million years as compared to the Bigo subbasin, which has been uh, less uplift and more subsidence. And these have been also highlighted in our uh, backstripping uh, subsidence that we have done. So this, this is a bit of uh, uh, correlation that we picked up. And on the larger tectonic scale, we, we, we plotted our total subsidence rates and sediment accumulation rates and compared them to the larger tectonic uh, events that have affected the Northwest Shelf. So uh, the first anomaly that we picked up is in early in Jurassic, where you have a, a high uh, sediment accumulation rates and total subsidence rates, mostly in the subbasins as compared to Exmouth Plateau and the ranking platform. So just apologizing that there's a, a lot of lines on this plot, but what we are trying to, to, to show is that uh, we're just focusing on the anomalies. So the red line and the black line, these are Exmouth Plateau and ranking platform. The subbasins are blue, uh, yellow, orange, and gray. But the most important part that we are trying to show here is the, the, the edges where we have uh, sediment uh, accumulation rates and total subsidence rates anomalies uh, compared to the global tectonic uh, events that we have up here. So this period, this is where, uh, uh, this is where the, there was rifting between the Australian continent and the Indian continent. And uh, the beginning of that rifting is highlighted in our sedimentation and subsidence patterns. And later, 
this is where you, we have uh, the actual separation of the Indian continent from the Australian continent. And we also have anomaly in all our regions for subsidence and sediment accumulation rights. So after this period, there's a bit of uh, anomaly around uh, probably 90 million years and uh, up to probably 80 million years ago. And this could also correlate with the uh, separation of the uh, Australian continent from the Antarctica. And uh, there's a bit of uh, signal in both, in all the regions, in both sediment rates and then sed uh, subsidence rates. But interestingly, there is a huge anomaly uh, around 70 million years, but we don't have any major tectonic event in the global, uh, uh, on the global scale. And this is particularly when uh, the tilting of the Australian continent is suggested to start. And this, there's that good correlation of the anomaly that we get in our sediment accumulation rates and substance rates. Uh, but if we look at the tectonic events, for example, like uh, extension and, and rifting, we don't have that. So this correlates with the tilting. And after that, uh, there's a bunch of tectonic events, but this mostly were happening in the northern part of the Northwest Shelf, where you have the Australian continent uh, uh, colliding with the Eurasia continent. Uh, and there's, there's a bit of a signal there, but there isn't much correlation with those events. But most of the, most of the uh, emphasis is on this uh, tilting, the beginning of tilting and then uh, going towards the present. So what we have actually, uh, what we are concluding uh, from this is that there's a higher correlation in the uh, sedimentation patterns and substance patterns in the Northern Carnarvon Basin uh, with the, uh, the larger, the, the, the regional tectonic events that were happening around the Northwest Shelf and uh, we also picked up that signal from the beginning of the tilting of the Australian continent in the sedimentation and subsidence accumulation rates. And uh, our porosity model that we, we developed uh, has also shown a bit of correlation with the distribution of the petroleum systems in the Northern Carnarvon Basin and the, and the uh, and uh, yeah, on a, on a regional scale and a local scale. So, yep, I think, I hope I didn't take too much time. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, yeah, so of course, uh, the Northern Carnarvon Basin has, yeah, be, being the one of the biggest petroleum. Uh, regions in, in, in Australia, it has been studied extensively and the stratigraphic uh, ages and the, the, the regional tectonic events surrounding that place have been very well documented. Of course, what we can depend on is the information that we get from the published uh, uh, articles and, and most of these uh, for, for the data that we are using is coming from the, uh, the national offshore uh, petroleum systems, uh, information systems management. So, which is pretty much reliable, but yeah. So that's, that's all we can, we can say, but yeah. We, and peaks with fair rates have passed into the year, so. Yeah.
Is it the Q&A or the chat? Oh, please repeat questions for those on Zoom. Okay, so if you want to... All right. All right. So yeah, the question was that how certain are we about our uh, the ages that we are working with? Uh, because we have an anomaly at let's say 70 million years, maybe it could be a meteorite just uh, hit the continent or something like that. But yeah, so what the the, the response is that uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure they, they had the response, but I'll probably just repeat it that yeah the data that we are using we are getting it from very reliable sources which is the national offshore uh, petroleum information management system which is which is managed by the australian government and 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 most of the data sets that we are using and the literature that we are using surrounding the area is very well uh, published and and so that's that's all we can rely on <laughs> uh, well, so the question is, uh, can we speculate what this event could be? Uh, so I think in, 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 in the sense of uh, the cause of the tilting of the Australian content, maybe that could be, uh, 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 it could be anything, right? Yeah, I mean, obviously we want to head towards looking at the mantle and, and, and processes and uh, Yeah, yeah, that that yeah, that could be a very interesting uh, 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 research to do. And but the the tilting has been really well documented. I think what is remaining is to just uh, decide how it started. Maybe someone was pushing it or something like that. <laughs> yes, thank. You. So, so that's kind of what I was referring to, but yeah, okay. So, you know, the question is, uh, can can mantle plumes be responsible for this? So we we looked at um, in in uh, yeah in in uh, south uh, in the South Atlantic, we have uh, changes in plate velocities and subsidence history, which is generated by um, not just one mantle plume, but a series of um, like movements of magma or mantle, sorry, mantle flowing in the asthenosphere at about 300 kilometers. So they did a lot of geophysics looking at actually constraining this asthenospheric thickness. And it looks it looks like it's uh, around 300 kilometers thick rather than say 600. And with a, th with a narrower channel, then you can actually have much faster asthenospheric flow because, uh, you know, you're sort of integrating the overall flux and, um, and so that you can have much higher velocities that are actually driving plates and driving, uh, and then also creating pressure gradients across continental scales. So then you're looking at, say, um, you know, it's, you know, the, the plates are moving at a, a few centimeters per year. Well, these these velocities can be an order of magnitude higher than that in the asthenosphere potentially, uh, and that creates pretty large gradients, which can lead to uplift of a few hundred meters. Uh, even a kilometer or more um, across, and so you get subsidence at the other end. So we did, we did look at that in with a former student in um, in the Caribbean, for example, and you've got like flow through the Caribbean, which creates quite a uh, a dynamic topography signal, and you can pick that up from subsidence alone. So without looking at sort of fancy mantle convection models, you can just look at the the sedimentary basin um, structure, and you can see that this signal is sort of captured in that. So that and it's also captured in um, the SKS splitting uh, directions. Um, so, yeah, something that we'll we'll have to look at for this in in future. Yeah. It just, it goes away after a while. Uh, more. 
good. All right, thanks, thanks, Ned. Did you do you have any questions, Ned? <laughs> you can hear us all right. Yeah. 